All right, and everybody can see all this? Okay, I'm assuming that's a yes, excellent. All right, so like Dr. Carr said, I'm gonna do the infratemporal fossa. I don't have any financial disclosures or anything like that. Uh, so for the outline, I just, I wanna go review a little bit of the anatomy, go over a little bit of pathology, um, but then I, I kinda wanna focus on how we approach the infratemporal fossa and kinda draw some conclusions from that. Of note, this picture I got over here um, which is, it's interesting to me because it's from a, an anatomy book called Edward Pernkopf's Atlas of Anatomy. It's not in production anymore. I think they stopped producing it in the late 80s. Um, he was a German guy associated with the Nazi party. Um, and there was question of whether or not they were actually using um, concentration camp victims uh, as some of their anatomical figures. Obviously not this one because it's from 1953. Um, but some of the earlier drawings, but it, it's got some of the best anatomical drawings you can find. Uh, and actually you'll find them in a lot of other books as well. Uh, so the anatomy of the infratemporal fossa, um, this guy is pointing it out for us right here. It's in kind of a, a weird spot, as you know, from med school anatomy uh, under the zygomatic arch here, medial to the mandible. If we're looking on the inferior view, we can see we're buttoned up right against the pterygoid plates here where the pterygopalatine fossa is. Uh, so it's not an easy place to get to, and there's a lot of stuff that can happen in that area. Uh, just a brief review of the boundaries of it. Um, superiorly, uh, it's going to be, you know, the roof of it is going to be the sphenoid, the greater wing of the sphenoid. Uh, some of the temporal bone, all this, we see foramenal valley here, spinosum, uh, foramen rotundum would be up in this area. Anteriorly, uh, it's going to be bounded by the infraorbital fissure and the maxilla. Laterally, if we had the mandible here, we'd see the, uh, the condyle of the mandible, the coronoid, and the ramus kind of binding, uh, binding us laterally here. Medially, we're coming up to the lateral pterygoid plate. And we know we got some muscles coming off of that. I won't go over everything there. And inferiorly kind of coming towards us, uh, we're going into the parapharyngeal space. So those are our anatomical boundaries. Let's review what's in it. There's a lot of stuff that's in it. What I have listed here uh, is just general. You know, we're gonna see the pterygoid muscles, which we saw on the earlier picture, kind of kind of coming out like this, the lateral pterygoid and the medial pterygoid kind of making that seven. Uh, temporalis tendon is gonna be coming down there, attaching to the coronoid process. We'll have our internal maxillary artery. Um, if you've ever done surgery in this area, you're aware that there's a pterygoid venous plexus because it wants to bleed like stink when you get into it. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, for other neurovascular stuff, we're looking at our uh, trigeminal uh, mandibular division coming out in this area, the otic ganglion. Uh, so if we take a look at it in this picture here, we've gotten rid of the zygomatic arch. Uh, most of the mandible is gone. If we follow our vasculature up, we see our external carotid and we know its terminal branches are the superficial temporal, uh, internal maxillary, or you can just call it maxillary. Uh, some other branches coming off of that, the middle meningeal artery, um, which is normally splitting the auriculotemporal nerve right here. And then we got some deep temporal branches uh, and we know that terminates as a sphenopalatine artery over there. And then if we look at a foramen rotundum coming down, we see our, like we already mentioned, our auriculotemporal nerve, which is carrying uh, postganglionic parasympathetic fibers um, over to the parotid region. We got our inferior alveolar nerve coming down. We have our lingual nerve with our quarter tympani coming right into the back of it for taste of the anterior two thirds of the tongue. And then there's some buck, buckle branches as well. So there's a lot going on in there. Uh, I just wanna make a beef, uh, beef, brief mention of Angren's line. Um, it, it's a measurement dividing up the maxillary sinus. Uh, so it's measured from the medial canthus down to the angle of the mandible. And it's kind of dividing us up into this superstructure and infrastructure. It's more of a, uh, a, a historic line from what I've read about it, uh, because in the past, 
you know, if you had some kind of tumor or mass that was in this superstructure or more, more posteriorly, you had a poorer outcome. Um, but now, you know, with modern surgical techniques, radiation therapy, I don't think there's really uh, any significant differences, um, whether you're, uh, you know, inferior or superior to this line over here. Uh, but we think uh, when we think about masses or tumors, something in the maxillary sinus, where, where are things going to spread to? Uh, if we're looking kind of in this superstructure up here, we can see we can get a lot of spread up to the skull base, into the orbit. If we're going back into the infratemporal fossa, um, so we, you know, we want to be aware of where things are going to spread if we're looking at a mass uh, in the maxillary sinus. Briefly, um, some pathology that we can find in the infratemporal fossa. Uh, the way I like to think about pathology or differential diagnosis, I like to use the, the kittens mnemonic with three T's, um, which will stand for you know, something that's congenital, infectious, trauma, tumor, toxic, uh, is it endocrine in origin, and I think that NS is neuropsychiatric. Uh, so what we're, what's going to be on our differential is, um, you know, things like infection or do we have some kind of maxillary sinus infection that's spreading through the bone causing osteomyelitis and invading the infratemporal fossa? Do we have congenital lesions uh, like mangiomas or lymphangiomas? Uh, in teenage boys, um, you know, they, they present with this recurrent, these recurrent nosebleeds. We start to worry about uh, juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. Um, and then we're looking for other malignancies that can develop in that region too. So, you know, bone tumors, chondrosarcomas. Uh, recently, we actually just did a biopsy of this woman who had uh, tumor spread through her maxillary sinus into her orbit, starting to invade the skull base and the biopsy actually came back as a lymphoma. Um, so that's, you know, something we'd send over to medical oncology. Uh, it's more of a medical problem uh, than, than needing a big resection. Uh, we're also looking out for nerve sheath tumors uh, like schwannomas in this uh, radiograph down here. We see a big schwannoma in the uh, infratemporal fossa, you know, obviously expanding into other spaces as well. And when we're thinking about nerve sheath tumors, we also want to look for thickening of the cranial nerves themselves uh, or foramen expansion because that means there's involvement. If your foramen's expanded, uh, the, the, some involvement of the nerve or the tumor itself is probably invading the skull base. Um, so we got to think about that stuff. Uh, we're also thinking about glomus tumors and in head and neck cancer, always thinking about squamous cell. Um, because we're coming up to the parapharyngeal space, uh, minor salivary gland tumors as well. So how are we going to get there? We know the infratemporal fossa is under there somewhere. Um, are we going to go through the nose? Are we going to go right through the face here? Are we going to come down low? Are we going to come from back here? Are we going to come from up here? Uh, there's a whole lot of ways to get there, and I'm going to go over some of those. First one um, is uh, uh, endoscopic medial maxillectomy. Uh, these are some pictures from a rhinology book. Um, just to get you oriented, we're looking in the, in the right nasal cavity on this side. Uh, so we got our septum here. If this wasn't already resected, we'd see our inferior turbinate running all the way along here. Um, but this, there's already been a you know, maxillary antrostomy and the uh, lateral wall has already been opened up. Uh, so when we're trying to get into the infratemporal fossa, we're going through the posterior wall here. When we take down that posterior wall, we start to see this. We see our internal maxillary artery coming up and we know it branches uh, and terminates as a sphenopalatine artery. We can see foramen rotundum and our maxillary division of um, cranial nerve five. This was a, uh, a paper I re was reading on medial maxillectomy for getting into the infratemporal fossa. Unfortunately, this is the other side of the nose. This is a cadaver dissection they did. Um, so we're looking at the left side of the nose here. Uh, so our posterior coena is back here. Our sphenoid sinus is up here. 
we can see our Vidian canal here. We've taken down a lot of the posterior wall, the maxillary, maxillary sinus, and we've run right into our internal maxillary artery. Behind that, we can see some fibers of our uh, lateral pterygoid muscle. I labeled it out on here um, because they use a lot of, lot of abbreviations. Some other cool things to see back here that, that we don't see that often, a greater palatine nerve coming down there. Which I, I, I thought that was interesting that they were able to see that. Um, so when we're, when we're doing medial maxillectomies, uh, you have limited access. You're really gonna get to the medial and superior infratemporal fossa. Uh, it, it's tough to go more lateral than that. But if the tumor's in the right spot, it's functionally and cosmetically, it's great because there's no cuts you see on the outside. It's not some massive surgery. Uh, it's, you know, it's almost like a routine sinus surgery except going a little deeper. Let's move on to some more invasive stuff. The next procedure uh, is a maxillary swing. And actually this is the same patient that we saw the schwannoma in on that radiograph earlier. So she's got a schwannoma of her trigeminal nerve. Um, the maxillary swing is, is just as it sounds. We're literally gonna swing the maxilla out that way. Um, and the way we do that is obviously we have to get through our soft tissue envelope first. Uh, so this incision here, uh, it's called a Weber-Ferguson and it's, it's extended out a bit so we get more tissue retraction. When, they're, when you're making this incision, you pretty much wanna go straight down to bone uh, because the way the maxilla is getting fed blood, it's mainly through the soft tissue envelope. Uh, so we don't wanna interrupt that too much. So we get right down to bone. These are the outlines of where our osteotomies are gonna be. We're essentially uh, you know, completing a, a Lafort fracture to really open that up, get the maxilla mobile, swing it over so we can look into the infratemporal fossa. If you look at the intraoral uh, mucosal incisions, they're a little more lateral relative to the uh, osteotomies you're going to do, uh, and that's to prevent, you know, two sites of disruption from being right on top of each other and causing something like a uh, oronasal fistula. All right, let's start at the top left here. We've made our soft tissue cuts, and we've carried this through the central incisor, made our mucosal incision, and we get right down under periosteum. Now we make those osteotomies in the, in the spot we drew it out, and we literally swung the whole maxilla over that way. So for orientation, you can see here's one of the central incisors, here's the other one. Now we're looking right into the infratemporal fossa there. And in the next picture, we can see that big schwannoma there. I believe this one had a little intracranial extension as well. Uh, so it was a combined case with neurosurgery. Uh, so you kind of come at it from below and above. This green piece here is uh, like extradural within the skull base. Um, you know, so that's why you gotta have neurosurgery on board for something like this because a lot of times you're getting into the skull base. And when we're putting it, everything back together, we swing it right back. We got to tack some plates on here in at least three spots. So we're getting the uh, vertical buttresses secured here. And then we got one coming right across the midline of the maxilla here. And it actually closes up pretty, pretty darn nice. And you can see the results. There's very minimal, uh, you know, aesthetic deformity from something like this. Uh, you'd think you'd have a lot more from doing such a big procedure. Uh, I mean, you can see a little ptosis of this lower lid here. You know, she might develop a little ectropion, so the uh, lower lid kind of uh, pulls out. Um, this specific procedure, the maxillary swing, is pretty good for tumors on the medial aspect of the infratemporal fossa. I feel like that tumor that was presented here would be a little, a little big for doing a medial maxillectomy alone. Um, so we also get a good view of the pterygomaxillary region and the nasopharynx. All right, now we got a tumor in a different spot. Uh, this patient had an extracranial and intracranial meningioma. 
and we're going to approach it through the mandible. Uh, it's similar concept. I think could you could call it a uh, mandibular swing actually, uh, but we're going to make our soft tissue incisions extend it out so we have good mobilization. This is an intraoral view right here. There's a retractor down here. Uh, extending the incision on the floor of mouth kind of laterally and then as we come up past the retromolar trigone over here we're going all the way up into the superior gingival buccal sulcus because right in that area is where the infratemporal fossa is. So we've made our cuts, we got our proposed osteotomies, we split those and now we can see this incision extended all the way up into the superior gingival uh, buccal sulcus. And that's where we're gonna get our exposure of the tumor. This, this example didn't really have a good clear cut tumor that you could see from this view. Um, but since it's at the skull base, we gotta go through our lateral pterygoid here. Uh, and after the resection, this also had a, a, an intracranial component with neurosurgery. Uh, you know, you've got a skull base defect that's filled here. So this is better for uh, lateral aspects of the infratemporal fossa. Um, you know, this is one of the ways to get lateral, uh, but we can also disassemble the zygomatic arch and do more of a transfacial approach as well, uh, which we'll show next. This woman actually had a uh, chondroblastoma of the mandibular condyle. Uh, it was extending up into the glenoid fossa where the condyle articulates at the skull base on the temporal bone. Right here, they just, they have the, you know, basically the tumor extent outlined. Uh, and this big incision is because they also have to go intracranial to get this. And when they resect that tumor, they likely had to take some of the zygomatic arch as well to get down to it, uh, get a good visualization. When they resect that tumor, they didn't say exactly what's going on here, but I think they resected out the glenoid fossa and had to repair the dura here. That's what I think is going on. But what I really wanted to show here is the preservation of this, which is the facial nerve. That's why we have to know the anatomy so well, because as you're going down, there are a lot of structures in the way and it's easy to cut right through something like that. And this is her outcome. Um, uh, aesthetically, looks great. They said she had no facial nerve weakness uh, postoperatively. Um, when I first saw that, I was, I was kind of, it was kind of weird. I said, "Well, something doesn't look right here." And then I looked at her eyes; it almost looks like she has Horner syndrome. They didn't mention anything about that. Um, but that's another good approach for the lateral infratemporal fossa. Lastly, I want to I want to keep this one very simple because the posterior approach is going through the temporal bone um, get really complicated. Um, Linnea did the chief Linnea did the um, lecture on temporal bone anatomy, so you know how complicated it is just from that, uh, and these resections complicate it even further. Uh, so there's three general approaches. Um, through the mastoid and temporal bone. They're, they're called the fish types. Uh, this one that we're representing here is the fish type A. We end up doing a radical mastoidectomy. Um, and what I thought was cool about this is you're doing a anterior transposition of the facial nerve. So you can see we, we got our mastoidectomy, our sigmoid sinus coming down here. Uh, and our facial nerve coming right out the style of mastoid foramen. So what you have to do for this is totally open up the fallopian canal, the facial nerve uh, where it runs, and pull it out and transpose it anteriorly to get it out of the way. Uh, and that's really how you're gonna get to where you need to go because then we're gonna have, we're gonna get access to the jugular bulb, uh, the petrous carotid, and the posterior portion of the infratemporal fossa, which we can see right here. So we got our jug internal jugular vein, internal carotid artery, infratemporal fossa would be over in this region. Uh, an important thing is shown here that you want to get proximal and distal control of these big vessels because if they start going, they really start going. Uh, this is showing some proximal control of the um, sigmoid sinus and then we got distal control with our vessel loops around the internal jugular and internal carotid as well. 
Another one is the fish type B. I won't go through exactly how it's done because I'm not sure if I even fully understand it. Um, but this is gonna allow us access to different portions. So we're, we're gonna get the superior infra, infratemporal fossa, but we're also getting even deeper in, this, in the skull base here, the clivus, the petrous apex. And I wanted to show this picture uh, because I, I thought it was really cool because I mean, they got all these vessels controlled and what they got opened up here is the internal jugular vein with the big um, glomus jugulari tumor. So you can see it right in the middle of the lumen there. The last one was the uh, fish type C um, and this is giving us even more medial uh, um, a more medial view of the skull base because uh, we're getting all the way to the nasopharynx now, right around the eustachian tube, the rostral clivus, uh, pterygophaltine fossa, and then uh, as well as the uh, infratemporal fossa. Uh, just, just point out some structures here so we get generally oriented. We see our facial nerve coming down here out of the stylomastoid foramen. Here's our mastoid actomy cavity with the sigmoid sinus. And now we can visualize the eustachian tube, the mandibular nerve, lateral pterygoid plate. Now for this resection, uh, you have to combine it with taking a chunk of the zygomatic arch, kind of like you did in the gross anatomy laboratory. Similar way to get there. Some honorable mentions for this. Um, the Caldwell Luck. Uh, you know, which has fallen out of favor. Open sinus surgery is in general fallen out of favor. This is a picture of a Caldwell Luck here. It's an intraoral. Uh, intraorally, you're getting into the maxillary sinus and you can get to the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus and into the infratemporal fossa. Wouldn't really be a great uh, approach for, for a big tumor. Um, what I did read was if you are planning on doing uh, depending on what kind of resection you're planning on doing, the way you biopsy it, you want to stay out of that path because you know, you know you'll just mess up all your planes. Uh, so if you're planning on doing uh, an endoscopic medial maxillectomy, um, you might want to second uh, you know think twice about going through the posterior wall and messing up some of the anatomy back there. We can also get to the infratemporal fossa transcervically. Uh, that is way up there. You're digging deep in a hole uh, and you're not seeing a lot of the infratemporal fossa, but you can get up there. We can also get there through the Gillies incision, uh, which is up in this region, normally used to get under the zygoma for fracture reduction, so we can pull it out that way. But if you get down right on top of the superficial layer of the temporalis fascia, you can get an endoscope down in that area and get to the lateral portion of the infratemporal fossa. And then that goes along with like lateral brow endoscopic incision as well. In conclusion, uh, as you already knew from doing gross anatomy, the infratemporal fossa is three-dimensionally, it's really complicated. Um, and, and you gotta understand its structures if you're gonna do surgery in that area, uh, especially if you're taking a posterior approach through the temporal bone. Um, uh, you know, to be safe, you got to know the anatomy in and out. Um, and the other conclusion I drew from this, there's always multiple ways to get to the same spot as you saw with that. And I think that's all I got.